everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Hatzel. I'm the education manager here at the History Center, and I'd love to welcome you into our uh, little home away from home for many of us uh, who love history. Um, we're so excited to have Susan Snyder Salmon here to present her uh, talk called No Rolling Stones. We had a fun time going back and forth on titles, and I said, as a Rolling Stones, or er, Fan. <laughs> Let's go with this one. Okay. That's not bad an argument. Um, well, and then, then we have the added, uh, whoops, wrong. Oh. <laughs> uh, I need to go back. Hang on. Oh, come on. Oh, technology. There we go. This is the second half of the title. Oh, landscape perspective. Yeah. <laughs> so Susan had a phenomenal talk not too long ago, I'm going to say last fall, at the local history club luncheon, and so we reached out and said, would you like to do a part two? And she said, oh, I'm going to have more research. This is going to be great. Oh. So I hope you all enjoy. She is incredibly enthusiastic about this uh, project. <laughs> and dry stack stone walls. Who could have a better habit? <laughs> They're very cool. So I hope you please enjoy and uh, stick around if you have any questions. Thank you. So you already saw the uh, you already saw the, the promo that's coming up uh, in terms of um, the, the statues on Easter Island. But one of the things that I, that I expanded from the last talk is to step back once we've looked at the walls, to step back and see a bigger picture that they're not just where you see them. There's the where were they question, which is what I'm sort of tracking down now is where were they. So when we were talking about the title, um, we were thinking, okay, a little bit of rock and roll when I found this, which I thought it was kind of funny, um, but just gets you in the mood of, you know, this is really just loose and open and um, ask any questions if you've got one, um, let me know as we go through. So um, dry stack stone walls. Anybody recognize either of these places? Well, you don't count. <laughs> I this is Martha, and she will not tell you this, but a lot of these photographs are hers. A lot of them are mine, a lot of them are hers, and she has a wonderful life. <clears throat> is the one on the left, is that uh, on like the campus cemetery? Yes, it is. Dunn Good Cemetery. Mm -hmm. Just to the east of the Indiana Memorial yeah. Union. And that's a real, you can see the union there in the background. Very good. Anybody else? This one? That's actually um, Mount Gilead, Mount oh, okay. on 45. So we're going to jump around the county, and I'm going to try to make it somewhat going the opposite direction I need to go. We're going to jump around the county, but first I want to start with some basics. So you've got different people using different terms. These are classic definitions. The rock fence, you get a bunch of rocks, you put them together, you grab them out of the creek, you grab them out of the yard, wherever, and, and you make a fence. A stone fence, classically, is quarried, shaped, dressed, somebody created it, a work of art. It, 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 it wasn't just thrown together, it was, there was a plan. And if you see the dry stone conservancy folks who repair these walls, they'll lay out stones like half an acre, to figure out how they're going to rebuild a small section of the wall. They're, they're doing a little art thing and putting it together to make it all fit. So it's like a geometry in the head. And then the stone rows, which you're, you're used to hearing and seeing in New England, where you see a lot of the glacial rock that just sort of comes up through the ground, and those are collected in stacks, and you see uh, sort of rounded edges which is more like the style, which is more typical to what we're used to seeing, those gorgeous landscapes from Scotland and Ireland. And it's important to remember that's where this process, maybe it started with the Romans, maybe before that, but we're thinking of the people who came to the United States who started to build the walls in this country and then migrated up to Indiana through Kentucky, pretty much. So. This, it, it's all sort of a, a sequence of events as different people in different places. They've got stone. What are they going to do with it? Well, they build walls. We're going to explore why that is. 
By the early 1800s, if you remember, Kentucky wasn't Kentucky, it was still Virginia. But that area that is Kentucky, think in your head geography, where's Lexington? And then draw a circle around Lexington. And we'll see a map a little bit later. That area is uh, entirely uh, in, at, at, at ground level, is where this stone to build the walls just creeps out. Just, you'll walk in along and you'll trip over it. It's right there in the field. So it's kind of hard to farm, right? So you take that rock and get it out of the way, and what do you do with it? Well, you don't have any trees, or your trees are limited, so you start building walls. And by the mid-1800s, that area around Le Lexington was just everywhere covered with stone walls. And I go down there and just salivate driving along the roads, going, whoa, there's more, there's more right there. Um, the rock can be cleared. In Kentucky, they actually passed um, several laws, and they had toll roads. And the property owners were required to build the walls, mostly to keep people on the roads, but also to keep them off the property. But those roads kept them going, so they had to stop and pay the tolls. So they couldn't go off and get around them. So it was a way to build the, the coffers. Many walls were used to secure stock. So if you think of the purebred concept that we think of when we think of Kentucky, bluegrass and the horses, well, the same was true of livestock. They were going back to England and getting purebreds. And these walls were strong enough to keep the livestock from cross-pollinating. You know, keep them on your property and keep mine over here and keep yours over there. And also not to lose them because they were pretty st standard uh, substantive walls. And what they found is, is the wood rails, maybe 10 years if it was well made, but the stone walls would last indefinitely if they were well made. So we see this ubiquitous wall, Scott County down in Kentucky, oh my gosh, they're absolutely everywhere. At every corner, and they, were, they mar demarcated almost every property. Uh, the presence of the, the particular limestone that we'll be looking at, and there's some samples over here, by the way, from different walls around the county. That particular limestone is an indicator that it's maybe not the best place to be growing crops, but livestock can eat off the grass that typically <coughs> grows. So it, again, the presence of the stone gives the opportunity to build the fences. The fences are there to maintain the livestock, and the livestock is brought there because they can maintain the space. It all sort of works together. Now, what we found here in Monroe County in particular is that some of the walls are directly out of the ground or out of a creek, but we also can see markings on some of the stones that show they were quarried. So in some walls, we can see that there was more quarrying done and a little less of the field gathering. So it's a matter of which walls are where and how, uh, who constructed them and how close the creek was. So in 1828, if you look back and you see some of the ads, people want to come to Indiana. Well, we've got water. You know, we've got these great wells. We've got limestone. This is before the Dimension Limestone explosion, which was later in the 1800s. And um, <laughs> you can come and live here nicely and just have unlimited fun. And then the early census records show us that there were a lot of stone carvers and stone and rock um, specialists in the area. Now, I suspect that some of them were working in the town and, and helped with some of the building, but the bigger quarries weren't open yet. So those workers were not quarry workers as we think of modern, you know, working in the dimensional limestone. These were people who were more hands-on. All right, so dry stack stone walls. Here's the first one, built without mortar. They're constructed where the stone is easy to obtain and not too far from the source. And they were frequently used to demarcate property lines. 
and also to create, if you will, you know, areas, field for particular kinds of livestock. The quarrying and construction uh, were often done by contract. So that someone was hired to build a particular wall in a particular place for a particular amount of money. We don't have too much of that written down. We have a few things. The construction trials, you, you can see how they change from place to place, like the walls is constructed on the north side of Bloomington versus Matlock area versus down at Church Lane. Very different styles of laying, if you're looking closely. They're very different styles of putting those fences together. So it's likely that those were different people doing the work. The stone masons obviously passed on the next generation. I found one family where there are four generations of stone workers, stone masons. Uh, and in many cases, the remaining walls are found where the stone was easy to obtain. So I looked around, I started looking when I, when I had established, okay, this is where we know the walls are. I started looking, where's the rock? And then I started finding more stone walls after looking to where the rock was. Uh, the dry stack, uh, we already did that. Let's go back to that for a minute. There, where were we? Yeah, see the column there? That's not a wall. That's post. You see what's attached to it? You see the metal? <coughs> here. A lot of places will see those stone pillars, particularly up in the Maple Grove area. And those appear to have been used to mark the cor property corners. We also see them reused and repurposed for different things. But we'll see them sometimes with metal attached that perhaps were gates or ways to move things in and out. Of course, as tractors got bigger, um, those became problematic because they were a little smaller. Rachel Peden in one of her books talks about uh, someone with a new big tractor who had backed up and broken one of their limestone uh, posts and was very upset. Um, and Rachel ran to get her husband who had some magic concrete fixer where they put the post back together because the tractors got too big to fit through what had previously worked for a wagon. So I, I find that just to be charming. Uh, all right, so we've been here. With the walls working well, then this new thing came along, barbed wire. And with the barbed wire, it was less of an issue for livestock. So there is a decline after the Civil War there's a decline because it becomes very expensive for the labor. After the Civil War, we also see within a generation, barbed wire comes in and pretty much replaces the need for this kind of fencing. In Monroe County, there are quite a few cemeteries that have surround. They're totally surround or partial surround. And those places, it is, it is theorized that they're still there because nobody is selling that land to put in a, a field. And so it can, it can stay and it wasn't disturbed. Although some of them have fallen down, so they've been disturbed. Uh, and they appear to have been built sometimes for prestige, saying, look at me, this is all mine. And sometimes the walls are small and sometimes the walls are very tall. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, quarrying and construction, we did that, hello. So, I'm not a geologist, so I could stumble here, but I'm going to talk a little bit about geology, because you can't get to the fences without getting a little bit of geology in there. Uh, how many people know what Salem limestone is? It's the dimensional limestone that everything is built from. It's different from the limestone that is building these walls. When you get a chance later, go and look at the samples over here from the different fences, and think about 
that when you see a building and the smooth limestone or the Alexander Memorial and the smooth limestone that's been carved, and you'll realize that they're not the same stone, they're not the same thing. This is a, uh, all the pictures, by the way, that Martha and I didn't take are either from uh, IU archives or from the History Center and, and everything is documented. So if you have a question about a particular a picture, let me know. But the Salem limestone has this particular uh, property that these huge saws that were developed, it can go this way, it can go this way, it can go that way. So it, it, it can cut any direction. And in fact, that's mm -hmm. the way they break it into blocks and, and carve it into different things like pillars. So it, it is in these huge deposits. And the only place in the world where it's available right here is right here mm -hmm. in a very narrow band. Now that's a, the old football stadium, which is now an arboretum. Mm -hmm. But there's this narrow, irregular band that kind of starts up near Gosport, flows through here, down through Bedford, and then it trickles down uh, through Washington on into uh, just the tip of Kentucky. And that means it. I mean, it's right there at the surface level. There's a small uh, amount that that shows, and it, it, there's a. The dimension limestone is, is uh, 50 to 75 percent of what is used in North America and in the world, in fact. So buildings that are built all over the world, the, the limestone comes from this region because it's accessible and easy. One of the reasons the railroads came in, because the railroads came to take the stone wherever it was going. So that helped develop our area. So the whole limestone industry is 100% Monroe County. This is one of my favorite pictures of the stadium. Mm. Um, and Steinsville is where it kind of started, because that's where the first outcrops were, the first railroad went in there. And then you may know the Mathers uh, stone quarries in Ellettsville uh, just exploded in the late 1800s, about 1880 or so, brought in all sorts of workers, housed them, um, and just did a tremendous amount of, of uh, quarry and shipping out to various places. What I like about this, if you look really close here, you're into track and field. You see how the track just sort of runs off into the ditch there? <laughs> I, I think that's just so great. There it is. I mean, and then up there is the Wells Library, if you can envision it towering up there in the corner. Um, you see that limestone was used to build these facilities. And here you have an outcropping off on 37 that shows us a little bit how it looks like in, in, in the real world when you do a cut through with a, a I-69 uh, going through. So you've got this, these horizontal beds. They're a certain amount. Sometimes they're deep. Sometimes they're, they're not so deep. Think a minute to out of where the bypass crosses college and Walnut and that area and then go just beyond that before you get to I-69 where you're doing some construction. There's about 80 feet down below that intersection of Good Salem dimensional limestone underneath that, just sitting there. Uh, but it's, it's below ground at that point. Okay, uh, and here's where we get a little bit scientific, the Mississippian period. Uh, laying things down is a pretty long extended period. We are looking at right here. The dimensional limestone is the Salem, and a lot of building is also done with the St. Louis. Both of those are, are available right here. We are going to take a really good look at the Harrodsburg limestone, because that's our fence stuff. Look at 12. And, and think of that narrow band. Is there anybody that, this is Monroe County. So you're starting up here near Gosport, coming down through and then on down. So within the Mississippian area, it's even smaller where we're seeing the dimensional limestone that's right at the surface. Here's a close up of how that breaks down in the Sanders group. And it, again, it's the Harrodsburg limestone that we're going to be focusing on as we go on through. 
All right, so who knows what those are? Who hasn't picked up a crinoid out of a creek, right? A little geode. Um, I, it, it, the, the fun, I, my favorite are the bryzoans, because they're, they just, that tells me that, that it's a Harrodsburg limestone, that particular dead animal. Think of the, the seas for the Salem dimensional limestone. That stuff got knocked around for eons. So it's really fine grained and teeny, teeny, tiny. The Harrodsburg, not so much. It didn't get knocked around as much. So you can see all the pieces parts. So it, it's a, it had a shorter life to, to become developed. So you've got all these animals that died to create this level, <clears throat> and when we get to it, you see this is what it looks like. And it was first um, named by uh, Hopkins and Siebenthal in 1897. They actually were in the Harrodsburg area where John Ketchum, if you know uh, Monroe County history, that's where the Ketchum farm was in that area, and he built lots of stone walls. This is the area where it was first named. And the important thing is to look very closely. Is it to remind you of anything? A teeny tiny, the, something like you eat? Check, check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Check cereal. So when we're doing research, we know the Harrodsburg Balls, if Chex Mix is present, it's the Harrodsburg limestone. And if you look over at any of the samples over here, and you look really closely, you'll go, Chex Mix! There it is! Did you have a question? Thank you. All right. I uh, don't know who knows Polly Sturgeon. Uh, she's in charge of education at the geology department. And, uh, she and I were out. In, I want you to go to Cascades, okay? Go up old, old 37, drive along the Cascades Road, and turn to go up toward the golf course. You with me? Mm -hmm. Everybody there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That west wall has seven different layers mm -hmm. of limestone right there. It's tough to see in the summer. You kind of have to do it when it's colder. So Polly is showing us the Harrodsburg layer, which is below, remember back to the diagram, just below the dimensional limestone. It's a little flakier. <clears throat> All right. This map is over there, much bigger. And it's a wonderful piece that shows Monroe County <clears throat> minus the tiny little portion that I cut off to, to make a better picture. You can see these colors. Anybody figure out where we are here? This is Monroe Lake. Here's where 69 goes around Bloomington. Bloomington in this area. This is up to Bean Blossom, Lake Lemon up here. Bean Blossom Creek going up to meet the Great White River up at Gosport. You kind of have your, you kind of have your, your, organization here. And this is then, uh, we're going to just take this area right here and I've blown it up over here so you can see how the different layers pop up to show you where, and you'll find along the creek line, there's this particular MHR. Anybody want to guess what that is? Harrodsburg limestone. Boom. So where the where the creek beds are cutting down through and that limestone is right there, that's where you can start looking for the walls if they don't show up in your face. So let's talk about the construction. What are these things? They're just, if you drive around campus, you'll see stone walls everywhere. There's not a dry stack stone wall in the bunch. Hmm. Not one. The one that's up on Fee Lane, I think has been reworked. It's not it's in its original shape and there's some mortar and they're holding a little bit of it together from what I can tell. So there's all of the stone may well be the Harrodsburg limestone, part of it. We know that the university bought a bunch from the Kellogg's farm because there's some paperwork on tracking it down. People know the paperwork, but I haven't tracked it down yet where the university bought a bunch of the field stone when the walls were taken down on the Ketchum Farm area. 
but how are they constructed and why? And that's a good question if you didn't have it. This is the dry uh, stone conservancy used with their permission. Um, they would love to help anybody who has a wall rebuild it. But there's several layers. This, this is sort of a, see the triangular end piece here? It's sort of longer, longer at the bottom, tapered to the top. That's a classic design that shows that it, it goes from a base tapering to the top. And as we look at these words, the foundation, the lower section, the core, which is in the middle, we can't see, the tie rock are going through, and depending on the mason, there may be more or less of that. It's not fill, it's not garbage that's dumped in there, it is strategically placed rock. Then you've got your upper section, cover stones, which are a flat surface, meant to disperse water, and then the coping stones, which disperse that water so it doesn't go down, so it doesn't have freeze and thaw, so it doesn't fall apart in our icky, wind, wicked winters. <laughs> so it's designed specifically to deal with the weather, and it wiggles a little, it has a little bit of move to it. Whereas a mortared wall, not so much, that's going to just stay wherever it's going to stay. And here's a drawing of it for those of you that like graphics. You can see a little bit more of the internal. Now, sometimes these, uh, as, as time, as the Civil War passed, we see more and more of these walls have a little bit more fill than they used to. And they're not as stable accordingly. So a lot of the walls in Kentucky started to fall. They have a state law that deals with the preservation of these. I'm hoping we can get a Monroe County ordinance to help support the walls, but Kentucky has a law, which is awesome. But you can see that down below, you have a very uh, firm foundation, kind of like a headstone in a cemetery. <coughs> what you see above, it should be as much, if not more, below to hold that structure in place. So you've got that going on here, depending on how high it is, you'll have a foundation. And then those coping stones are meant to help disperse the water to the, think of it as, as the cover, and then that gets, uh, drips off to the side. Yes. So is it hollow then as the core? It, it's not going to be, uh, a classically made wall is not going to be hollow. It, it will be filled and with, with stones that have been made to fit precisely. Oh. Yeah. This is maybe a follow -up. In terms of the foundation stone, outside of cut shape level of in the earth, anything else in terms of preparation below the stone that's done? I don't know of any. Okay. It's a good it's question. A it's nothing that the Conservancy has mentioned. Um, yeah. They do have a free book, by the way, that tells you how to do this. Yeah. Um, it's on the, the, the list if you got the bibliography when you came in. Um, and they have a wonderful website that has all of this. They're very good at education. So I, I, don't, I think they just probably dug down as far as they could and then put in the foundation. Yeah. Some places you couldn't go too far. Both good questions. So where are these treasures in Monroe County? Hiding in plain sight. Yeah. This is a map from um, 1865, which is a boon to any researcher. It is the most incredible map. It has everything you can conceive of on the map, and it's consistent and true. And the, the people who own property at this time are all named. The tributaries are there. Certain buildings are there. It's a Incredibly useful map, um, and it is available uh, on, on the IU Geology site. So if you're interested, go looking for it. It's amazing. Uh, but it this includes the township range and quarter sections, and all of those things you see listed, listed there, including who the county commissioners were at the time. Uh, but this is for researchers. This is the most incredible reference point. Um, and the documentation of the walls is hit and miss. I mean, what you see is what you see, but what you don't see is what was. 
So they're just casual things that, that appear. There might be something in a picture. I've got some samples to show you. Um, the deeds and property descriptions are pretty much worthless. Some, uh, some of the tax information, I'm just starting to research the tax levies to see if there were any properties that were levied higher taxes because of walls. Don't know that yet. Haven't found anything. I'm, I'm hoping maybe that was something that we taxed because it'd be cool to find it. Um, if you know, do how many people know what the interim reports are? Historic reports. Um, they're done done in the, what, what years were those done, Devin? 89 and then one more recently. Um, yeah, in, in the late 80s to 90s, the countywide historic, uh, mostly buildings, and there was also one for Bloomington. A lot of volunteers put in a lot of time, uh, uh, particularly looking at houses and structures, not so much walls. Occasionally they're, mis they're listed, but not, not all the time. Uh, and then the shard is the state database, and both the interim reports and the shard become standards when you're trying to designate historic um, information and, and, and prove that there is a lineage there, that there's history. These become very important, so if the walls are missing, what are you going to do? Uh, even the Monroe County History Center is a wonderful book on cemeteries, but about half of the cemeteries with walls, it states there's a wall. Some of them don't state it at all, but the pictures, there's a wall. So it's an inference process of slowly starting to identify where all of these pieces parts are. And I share with you that because just yesterday, Polly sent me a, an excerpt from that 1966 geology book. And this is a driving tour. Think for a minute now. Who does this? Who gives directions like this? Turn left at crossroads. No. What crossroads? I don't know. The road's probably not even there anymore. 0.6 miles to next century. We won't bother to tell you what road it is because we don't want you to know. <laughs> but 8.3, the dry stone fence to the left of the road. Whoa, ding, ding, ding. Dry stone fence. I know approximately where this is. It's somewhere down near Dillman, mm -hmm. maybe Victor, but in that area. Mm -hmm. But then it says that the road, uh, the, that the fence goes for a mile to the east and to the south. That's humongous. We don't have anything like that. So this was 1966 that that wall that's cited here was noted in this tour guide. And then it goes on in, inaccurately to say, 79 years ago, a man and a boy hauled stone from nearby quarries, not nearby quarries, no, maybe it quarried creek, uh, by horse and sled, maybe wagon, and built two rods, which is about 16 and a half feet per day, construction cost of 250 per rod. Well, 250 per rod, $8 per rod. We have lots of different numbers, but it wasn't a whole lot of money that people were paid to build these fences. Think about lifting those things. You just lift a couple of these rocks over here and you're going like five pound weights. You know, if they're not like weight. So this made me laugh at this 1966 and I had to dig it up and find it on the website. And then my friend Martha had shown me this not too long ago. Here we are looking, we think this is Smithville. We think it's down by the Speedway at Fairfax. But the picture was taken because they're doing a road grading. And they got the names of the people. The wall is wow. just there. It's not why they took the picture. But for us, if we can begin to look at the hillside and you kind of spec it out, that's where we think, Martha and I think it's down there at Fairfax and um, 37, right where the speedway is. So it's just hiding in plain sight. And then I, I'm here at the History Center, digging through the files back here and just, you know, blotty da -de da going through looking at all the stuff. And I go, holy smokes! It, Maple Grove Home Demonstration Women's Club. They're having a wonderful day, and they go up to Maple Grove Cemetery and do this goofy, turn your back to the camera thing. <laughs> and what's right there? A wall. And it's the Maple Grove Wall. 
But look how tall it is. The original walls were not short. And then over here you've got a wall in the background as well. So this is just, they're, they're just everyday things that were functional. And I'm looking at them as something spectacular. They're actually built to be functional. So my original research was, where are the remaining walls? I kind of inherited that from Cheryl Munson. She started this project in the 80s. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, when were they built and who built them? That's kind of where we started. But in the last year, that's expanded to where were they originally, because I know there were a lot more than what we see right now. And then, can we match up if this stone is in this fence, did it come from that creek? I'm real interested in that. I'm pretty sure it will. Um, and what the perspective of, of the full landscape? If we step back and look at the whole county, we're not going to see how I live out at Lake Lemon. Total clay. It's the only reason Lake Lemon works, because it holds the water. It's the first place the city built a lake where they had clay and it would hold the water. Hello. But there's clay everywhere. There's not going to be any stone walls unless it's been hauled in and built, because there's, there's none available. So my research expanded based on that. So where have you seen walls? I'm going to take a drink while you're telling me. <laughs> Certainly Who's seen one? Surely you've seen one. Certainly in the Maple Grove area. Maple mm -hmm. Grove is, is, they're really nice up there. Yeah. Covenanter Cemetery. Yeah. Covenanter Cemetery. Right. Covenanter Cemetery. Church Lane. Church Lane all falling down. I have a really good picture of that. There's one out, it's not the B Mine Trail, but when you, when you go from the roundabout and you turn south, there's a, just a, a stone wall there that's all by itself. You're going to see it. Okay. You're going to see it. It's, it's forgotten. Yeah. It's, it's in a very forgotten area on private property. So good eye. Anybody else? Bloomington Racetrack. Bloomington Racetrack, and that's where we think that uh, skitter was taken. Oh, Yeah. Okay, so um, who knows where the step bender farm is? Which I have my time. <laughs> Take out. The new 37 four lane. Everybody would like to do that. There are accidents on it every day. So pretend that's not there. What did you have to do to get south? You went down on Rogers to Clear Creek, and then you would cut over on the Springville Road, kind of angling to the sort of south and west. That road. Not that road, but close to that road. <laughs> <laughs> Went straight through what is now the Stiff Bender Farm. And it's, it's been on the National Register for about a year. Um, and in that research, um, what they found, and these are actually from that area. See the cute little geodes mm -hmm. that, are, that are in the rock? Mm -hmm. um, this, the work that was done here documented that Hugh Campbell was the first person to buy, and this was like in the, the very earliest land grabs in the 1816 period. Um, and their family grew, um, they established a farm that took up a huge amount of space, and later some of the slides I'm going to show you, there's some close-ups over here if you're interested in this in particular. But this area is um, the, the road that now goes through there is part of what you, was now Victor Pike. So you have that, that in your head. This is part of the wall. You can see up here, this is the house. Most of the outbuildings are out over here. Along here, there's a nice little stoop. Why is there a stoop in a stone wall? Anybody want to guess? For sitting. Sorry? For sitting. Louder. <laughs> no, it was there because there was a well, and people who were coming by with their horses could stop and water their horses. Mm -hmm. The landowner had said, because you couldn't get off, there was stone on both sides. So they had a nice little well there to feed, to let people have water as they were going by. Um, and what, what Danielle um, did when she was working on the, um, the stip vendor uh, application is 
put together as much information as could be documented. So in, in the uh, actual application, she refers to the time of 1882, which is a maybe. You know, it's a preponderance of the evidence at the time is telling us that maybe it was 1882. Um, can't go any earlier because we don't have any documentation that would tell us anything earlier. So she's putting all of this together for the National Register application. Um, and they're sort of combining that with when was Maple Grove done? We're going there next, by the way. Um, and at least two of the walls we have dates on from 1885 and 1878. 1888 now, we know um, one wall was built. So there's a period of time where we just, we don't know. And unfortunately, the estate records don't tell us. So I did just a little diddling around to see what's going on. All right, I don't expect you to jump right in here and know where we are, but this is 4 lane 37. This is pretty much Victor Pike going across here. This is the gas station. Oh, I'm sorry, there's the gas station and here's the Stip Bender farm. This is Church Lane. Mm -hmm. This orange area was what the Campbells owned. And if you look at just the right time of year, you can see stone fencing here. And there's an interesting little wall right along there that we recently were able to save. I'll talk more about that in a little while. This is also an aerial view from the 50s that shows you this was farm territory, not a whole lot going on. But you, the one thing you can see is this line here and this line here. You want to guess what that is? That the railroad? railroad. That was the railroad that came to get the stone from further up. I think that split off to go to Smithville pretty quickly from there. So everybody know where we kind of sort of are? This is section 29. And the far north side of the Campbell property is Church Lane. This is looking due east from the top of the hill on Church Lane. And you can see this is covered with nasty, invasive English ivy, and then it's just in various stages. This wall had to have gone much further down, and then it had to go back up toward the south. But this is what's happened down in Church Lane, is that things have fallen over. They've probably been hit a few times by the cars, that's <laughs> my guess. Um, let me know if I, I don't want to block your view here in my walking. So this is my sort of reenactment of history. Um, between 1834 and 1837, Hugh Campbell gets together with his first wife. They have a bunch of kids. Guess where they're living? Bourbon, Kentucky. Who's a bourbon aficionado? Mm -hmm. Where is it? Lexington area. Guess what's in their backyard? Dry stack stone walls. I mean, they're growing up with these walls. They're everywhere. So they move to uh, Monroe County. Uh, he gets a second wife. They have a couple more kids. Um, he gets remarried. The poll tax in 1840, what is that? 1840 what? 1841? The poll tax has Campbell the third highest wealth in the county. Anybody want to guess who the other two are above? Ketchum. Ketchum is number one. Borland number two. Okay. Guess who has property just north of this? One of his properties, Borland. Yeah. And Ketchum is the neighbor off to the yeah. west. Yeah. In 1850, the census is showing Campbell living with six of his remaining children. His real estate got, uh, valued at $7,000. This is really important uh, because he had the means to build the walls. Once he established his farm, he had the income to build the walls. Yes? How much would, do you know generally how much that would be in like... I really stink at those calculations. I have no idea, but it's a lot. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, Campbell then donated money for the Clerk Creek Church. He and his wife, Nancy, later are buried there. Um, and shortly after the family splits the property, Mary, George and Mary Stipp purchase it, and they have, a, a, again, another profitable farm. Uh, 20000 in uh, 1873 was 
a pretty good amount of money. Mm -hmm. Those folks came up from, from Harrodsburg, uh, where he had been living, but they came from um, down the south, down in Lawrence County and back in Bourbon County in Kentucky. The Stips uh, build a, a five-day Greek Revival Italian house, which is on the National Register now, and they go nuts with dairy cows and cattle, swine and chicken. If you go to the agricultural census for 1880s, they're just really kicking butt down there. We're talking <laughs> agriculture at its height in Monroe County. And do you think they would have stone walls? I'm thinking maybe they invested in stone walls. Can't prove that, but I'm thinking maybe they did. It was the home limestone? Um, 1882 is speculation. Um, I'm suspecting it was probably before that. And if you look down here, you'll see one of that where I pointed out the wall that was over to the west of 37. This is a reconstructed wall that recently got rehabbed. We'll see a little bit more about that later. Let's look at the pink section. This is that little donut area I'm talking about. Everywhere you go, you're going to trip over this stone coming up out of the ground. And every two feet, you're going to find a, a stone fence. Maybe not every two feet, but certainly every road. And they're still there. Like I say, in Scott County, they're in, along both sides of nearly every road. And then what happened is this massive um, amount of people migrated from this area straight up into southern Indiana, into Lawrence County, into Du Bois County, into Martin County, into Lawrence County, and Monroe County. So they came from good stock. And guess what? Hugh Campbell came to Monroe County from Bourbon, Kentucky, and George Stipp was born in Lawrence County, but his mom and dad were in Bourbon, Kentucky. So there's, there's a history of people knowing what the walls were, why they were built, how they were built, and poof, they're up here and they've got the stone in their yard. I'm thinking they figured out what to do with it. Can't prove anything yet. So the Rumpke, uh, Rumpke Company bought the property uh, north of the lagoons on the west side of 37. And uh, as a part of their getting access to that for storage, the Monroe County uh, Historic Preservation Board and the county commissioners worked to uh, have the Dry Stone Conservancy evaluate the wall and we were able to, in a sense, save it and have them reconstruct it. They got all the invasives out and they had a long-term plan on how to, to maintain it. So we're very excited about that. Um, it is going to be available for training if we ever get to that point. And um, we're just really kind of need to have that. So, you know, I'm making some conjectures here. Campbell and Stipp both had the money. Uh, if it wasn't Campbell, then it was Stipp. I'm guessing maybe it was Campbell, but maybe I can prove that someday, we'll see. But the important thing is, what's there is still there, and the people who own the property, at least on the Stipp Bender property, are going to be keeping it. Okay, who wants to go north? <laughs> Because we're going to bypass the university because we know there's nothing there. <laughs> All right, so the Ben and Thomas Owens farm. Uh, this is all one sort of big conglomeration. This is that wonderful map again. And if you look, you'll see here you've got Dorothy Owens. And this is her property. I'll explain who all these people are shortly. Tom Owens. This is his property. For those of you who are into the Modesto line, right up here is Modesto and Bonham Road, right up there along that block. <laughs> and who knows who Daniel Stout is? Daniel Stout was one of the first settlers, neighbor of the Owenses. Uh, he was with um, Harrison. He was an architect and uh, he built his house out of the, um, this, this is where Stout Creek takes off. This is the road, Old Arlington Road to Ellettsville. This is Mount Tabor Road, which is now Mount, now um, Maple Grove North, as opposed to Maple Grove yeah. East West. And this is Stout Creek. And Stout Creek is just one big quarry of Harrodsburg limestone. And Daniel 
built his house out of that limestone. It, it, there's a quarry right across the road from the house. And so all of these people are like really big early settlers. And the important thing to note is how big this property is, because that's the landscape we're looking at. It appears that at one point, that entire area plus Tom had walls. There's evidence that they took, took that entire property. Now, we're seeing again, you've got the, the crinoids. This is a, a copy uh, looking sort of south from the house. But you've got a ton of space, roughly 500 acres in the family. And I actually went just went through the, uh, the map, so we don't need to do that again. But uh, this is section 18, and that's the important when you're starting to try to figure out where things are, is to document what section you're in and what portion of the section you're in, because that's where the deeds come from, that's where all the references come from. So it's important to note that this is section 18. Look at that wall. It is this tall, and I'm five six, and that's it's it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It is cons the Maple Grove area is considered one of the the most dynamic and and the best in the county. It's because they're in great shape for the most part. This is the mansion that was built, and the walls go pretty much. This is a sort of a now it goes around a pool, but at one time it was called a rabbit garden. Can you imagine rabbit trying to hop over that puppy? <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. It's also been known as Fair Godhead, Ferris, Tefler, and the Bower Ray family own it now. Uh, they've, they've restored it. It's absolutely beautiful. So we're really happy with the work that they've done. This is now looking at, at the mansion from a different side, but you can see the garden, this area, uh, and there's actually a pool there. But you can begin to see the layers and the coping stones in place. A lot of these are as they were originally built. No one's ever touched them. Once in a while, Mrs. Ray may have hit the fence and had it fixed, <laughs> but that's closer to the mansion. Um, this is the big picture. This is the Ray property right here, this tiny little sliver. And this is section 18 pretty much right here. This is a utility cut. <coughs> and this is the edge of section 18. And guess what's buried there in the woods? A beautiful, intact, five foot tall, dry stone wall. Oh. Goes the whole perimeter. Also, I have found them over here off Stamp Court. They go, and this is Stout Creek here from once it came. There are walls here in between houses. Again, hiding in plain sight. They're all there. And I did talk to Mrs. Ray who says she's walked back in this area and there are pieces parts back there. So this gives you a sense of um, up here, this little house, we're gonna see a picture up here in a minute and you'll see the stone walls up there. This gets a little complicated and I'm gonna kind of jump through part of it. But John Owens actually, uh, purchased the property in 1816. He also purchased a bunch of property in Greene County. Um, and that's where things sort of get hot over in Greene County, because that's when Benjamin Inman arrives in 1831, give or take. Um, and he has two sons that are born there, Benjamin and <coughs> Thomas. Remember those names? Benjamin and Thomas. Yeah, they have the property. Well, Benjamin Sr. dies, the darn guy forgot to write a will. And so his, I think, best friend John, because I think, Mom, Miss Plummer, and Dorothy, Dorothy Plummer, and John, and Benjamin, and several other neighbors, and these are all bought property just, think of it as just west of Bloomfield, and they're involved with Van Slykes and the starting of Bloomfield. So if you had to do any research over there, you'll see that all ties these folks together. Um, but John, who is a bachelor, marries Dorothy, the widow, and takes all five kids and deeds everything to those kids. And I love this guy. And the reason I love this guy is he took, there's four boys and a girl. 
and the girl gets equal billing. Mm -hmm. The will is very specific. Do whatever you want, get rid of whatever you want, you know, sell whatever you want, but she gets as much as the boys, which I think was so cool for that, for that age. And all five children use Inman Owen throughout their lives. You'll find that a lot of them are buried in Rose Hill, and Inman Owen is used throughout all of their life, both names. So it's an interesting family thing going on. Um, in 19, 1840, we see John Owens is living in Bloomington with, um, of course, 1840, we didn't have names yet in census. We just had tick marks. So in 1840, we've got John, John and Owens living with the appropriate aged people. So I'm guessing that that had to be Dorothy and her five children at the location, which appears to be because of the neighbors. And if you look at the map and you know who had the property, it looks like it was right there on that property. There's a tiny little cabin, I'll show you the edge of here coming up, that we have been able to anecdotally date to this time period. So maybe they were all living in that little tiny cabin and maybe they weren't. Well, what does John do? He ups and dies. <laughs> so we've got an intestate Ben, and his estate is not adjudicated yet. It's still hanging out there because there's all sorts of different property going on. Now John adopts the children and he has a will, but all of this property is all over the place. That's possible he and his brother had some property here in Bloomington. I haven't been able to prove that yet. There's sort of a loose connection I'm still working on. Um, but the kids, two of the boys are older. Ben and Thomas are underage. So Dorothy steps up and takes uh, control of everything. I cannot find any of them in 1850. I'll keep looking. Uh, but in 1860, we see Dorothy at 59, living with her son Thomas, who's 27, and Ben, who's 25, in one residence. William is working in somewhere in Richland, at Richmond uh, town, uh, Township. And <coughs> the older son is Richard, maybe in Greene County, but I'm not sure. There's some stuff that's a little funky there, and I'm not sure that that's really him. In 1863, Ben and Thomas sign up uh, for the Civil War draft, but I can't find any war records. Uh, they were pretty young, so it's hard to say. And in 1864, we believe that's when the house started to be constructed, the mansion. The assault ports of, um, oops, where'd we go? There we go. Um, there is a brick that is found when they redid the house that implies that the, the dating of 1864. That's the date on the brick. I, it may or may not be, but there's no clay around there. They, they didn't go to Lake Lemon to get their clay. They probably went somewhere else, but there's no clay. So it had to be off-site somewhere and the hauled in. 1865, Fred Inman Owens is born to William and Hattie. Anybody know who Fred Inman Owens became? Gellettsville. He's the one who started People's State Bank. Oh. He is Fred Owens. This is him. Fred Owens Way used to be Maple Grove East-West. Hmm. It was changed and then changed back. Um, we see the census in 1870. We see the census with Dorothy Still listed as head of household and Martha, who married Ben that year at 35. Um, <laughs> They're all listed in the same household. Thomas, at 43, a couple of years later, marries <coughs> Rebecca Woodall, whose family farm is to the north. You've got a lot going on here. I'm not going to go through all of it in detail. But Tom and Ben marry very late in life. And Ben had one child. His name was Charles. Ben and Martha are living on the property. Son Charles is there. Martha passes. Shortly after Martha passes, Charles and his family disappear. Well, they went west. I found them. But they didn't have ancestry back then. <laughs> um, I found them out there. They were, he was working as a ranch laborer. Uh, and yet, the property was here. And it was, at that time, a lot of money. Fred handled it. Fred did all the uh, estate management. 
and put it all into holding. And the will states, if anybody, and I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing, if anybody ever finds Charles or my grandkids, they did it all. Did they ever find him? I don't know. Um, so, it, you know, you just, you don't know what's happening. 1878, there is a brick uh, with the name J. Adams. <coughs> Not a brick, but a field stone in the stone wall showing that a, um, this J. Adams, uh, we had presume, was one of the builders on the wall and saw fit to put his signature there. In 1880, uh, we see that Tom and Ben are living in a property with their individual spouses. And there's this guy named George Wiley. I heard of George Wiley and I went looking for him. And it took me three months. And <laughs> I finally found him. I, I've looked at his name probably a hundred times. He's right there on the census, living in the house, living on the property. So most likely, George, was that was he was paid to work on the walls, and if you're only doing 16 and a half feet a day, it could take you 10 years to do all of those walls that we're talking about. Any questions about the Ben Owens property? A lot more walls than what we're seeing today. Uh, anecdotal information that's been passed down, I haven't been able to document it, is that the walls were built in the 1870s, which kind of matches with what we know over a period of 10 years at a dollar a day for a perch at 16 and a half feet. Anybody want to start with lifting them? <laughs> <laughs> putting them up? <laughs> Woo! I just started Tai Chi. I imagine that's not, not quite going to get me there. There's the Adams uh, stone. And it is, I don't know where it is, but Warren Roberts, who was a folklore professor at Indiana University, started this after the uh, 1966 National Restoration Act got everybody kicked into high gear saying, hey, we better preserve what we can. Then the folklore department here in IU exploded and all sorts of good stuff was happening. And Warren Roberts sent people out everywhere. And we know a lot of what we know because of interviews his students did. <coughs> this is the wall going from the mansion looking directly to the west. And if you go down a hill and over a little creek, you'll come up to the west side, that wall I was talking about. Can you see it? Here and here. And that's on private property, so I didn't have the chance to get there yet, but I, I will eventually. And that goes way out past what I can see. It's humongous. It's huge. And the stone is clearly Harrodsburg, and these we see a lot of tool marks, so we know that there was a little bit more uh, hacking around going on, and, and some of those stones were actually shaped to fit. This is the, the cabin that's there. It appears to be original, and I'm thinking it probably is, because that wall is snug fit right to the, to the cabin. I'm, I'm, I'm in the lock. Oh, you're fine. Okay. Um, that, there was a question as to whether or not it's original. Um, it may be. <coughs> All right, so the Ben Owens farm, the walls were built, were they built to showcase a gentle person's estate. I'm pretty sure that Ben wanted to say, hey, this is us, and this is me, and we've got the money, and we've got the people, and we've got the rock, and we're going to build the walls. And you see, uh, and the, the rays have used, and may, it might be the people who owned it before them, um, a lot of these stone pillars that would have mar marked the corner of property lots were used as fill for the driveway. So they're all there. <laughs> They've just been repurposed. Um, Excuse me, question. Is that pillar, that's got, that's got mortar, doesn't it? This? Or is that just No, that, there's no mortar. No. That's just pity. That's a, it's a different kind of limestone. There's another wall that is up near, uh, closer up north. <coughs> and, and that just runs through the woods. So several, um, we're, gonna, we're kinda gonna leave Ben Owens property and go to uh, cemeteries. And there are several cemeteries in the uh, county that have walls. In 
certainly in a lot of these areas, you, you, you see, like if you drive to campus, you see these stone walls that bless, I think Herman Wells probably loved the walls and had them rebuilt on campus and got the stone and, and I love the homage, um, but it's, it's important to remember that those are not uh, original. They, there may have been some there before the university came in, I don't know, but what's, what's left is um, just sort of uh, repurposed, if you will. But once you start looking, and that's what the pictures are going to take us sort of a little tour here, um, we've got a wall of Bales Road. We've got huge walls at the corner of Fairfax and Walnut Street Pike, which is the speedway. We've got Beck's Crossing area along Victor Pike and Dillman Road, the Mathers Mansion in Ellettsville, along Hart Street Road at stage, the stage stop house that's there. There's a whole retaining wall, and then the, the park that's there. Ellettsville on the east side, which is also Vine, right? That area is Vine. Uh, Stouts Creek Road off Arlington, that's actually a, a, a subdivision, and we'll get to that here in a minute. That's uh, Shelburne Road also is reused. Those walls are not original. Uh, the woods east of Weaver Road, anybody ever remember one there? I remember tripping over it as a kid. My, just my, my good friend would say, be careful, there's a wall there, and yeah, in the middle of the field there's a wall. It isn't there anymore, or at least I can't see it. <coughs> On the corner of Bethel Lane and Old 37, I have friends who swear right there where you would turn to go to Marlin School that there was a wall there at some point in the recent past. I don't know. So on with the tour. We've been to Dunn Cemetery before. How many of you have seen this picture? Isn't that totally cool? This is looking toward the west, and that you can tell because the pine tree is, is in several pictures. But you see this lovely wall that is all the way around. But you do not see the Union. <laughs> it isn't there yet. And this is part of Clear Creek right here, which later got named Jordan River, which is now the river, which is going back to being called Clear Creek. So, uh, In 1835, Nancy Jane Campbell, Hugh Campbell, remember him? Remember Hugh? Down there? Uh, Hugh Campbell's oldest child buries James Jackson Alexander, and they honeymoon on horseback all the way to Monroe County, settling in Unionville. And the Alexander roots include a direct line to the Brewster sisters, and this is the God's Acre where the Brewster sisters and their descendants are buried, if they wish to be. This is a copy of a uh, <coughs> modern plan for the cemetery. Uh, this is like in the 50s, so obviously uh, the walls were in place. But the original <coughs> deed says nothing about walls. So how do we date that? You know, we've got pictures in 1901 with a wall. We've got a cell date in 1855 with no mention of walls. That's 50 years. We, we don't know. Maybe we'll learn more later, but right now we don't know when that wall was built. But interestingly, Beck Chapel, Daisy Woodward Beck, is a direct descendant of John Ketchum. And when she wanted Beck Chapel built, guess where she went to get her stone? <laughs> Back home. So all of the stone for Beck Chapel came from the Ketchum property. And I think they got a whole bunch more and used it on campus. And again, I think uh, Herman Wells was possibly involved in some of that. I think that's a pretty cool uh, part of it. And you can see some of these walls on the, on, in front have mortar, so they're not, you know, they were done after the fact. <coughs> but the one around the cemetery is, is fully loaded. All right, so we're going to pop down south. And this is the Speedway area. And you can see how long that is. And you can see the detail of some of, thank you, Martha. Uh, the detail of those stones, they have all this fun stuff in them. But you can see they, they probably suffered one or more car, car interactions <laughs> over the years. <laughs> and we think that the owners here <coughs> are probably who originally built that because there's a lovely creek right along there that just fits. It's, it's, it's in the zone. Um, it's likely that that's where some of the, the rock came from because there's a lot of it. Uh, and so that's more research to do on that one. Okay, who knows where Matlock Heights is? Did you know that there's walls there? Yes, there are walls there. 
and there are lots of remnants of walls. <coughs> this is City of Bloomington report in 2014, and I, I love reading it because it just cracks me up. Part of what the uh, council was saying when they approved the subplotting of, of Matlock Heights was, no, but they have to buy a house there. <laughs> it's too far down. <laughs> Nobody else has ever moved there. It's like totally, totally hilarious to think about that. This, this is one of the, uh, you know, see any Bloomington real estate agent. Um, so you've got this property, and you see this lovely barn in the background. Um, that's the original Matlock house. What's over here? <laughs> you know what's down in that gully right there that quickly becomes a huge drop and then feeds into Cascades Creek? Guess what's in that gully? Harrodsburg Field. No. This is, um, you would, the bypass is back there. So we're sort of looking south and east here. You can see this wall, it's still there, but it's the only one I think that is in place on the property. But if you drive around Matlock Heights in at least 50% of the properties, there's Harrodsburg limestone serving as a landscape material. It's everywhere. It's holding back gullies, it's surrounding flower pots, it's building retainer walls, so clearly it was there in much more abundance, and thankfully it was reused instead of buried. So it's everywhere. It's even, if you drive on North Dunn, because you have to go slow because all the deer are walking down the middle of the road, um, you'll see it. It's, it. And if you go driving through the night, you can't help it. It's everywhere. I wanted to show you this because if we step back again, go over to Maple Grove. Remember Daniel Stout? Remember the Owens family? Peter Wiley? This is where we see Barrels Road. This is where the property is that we're talking about in this general area. If there's no 69 and no 37, it's all one landscape. But there are multiple creeks going through. You've got Griffey Creek coming down, joining up with Bean Blossom, just a little bit further down. So it's all one area. It's not cut up by these crazy roads that we've got. Uh, the Matlock farm, um, George Matlock and his son Paris ended up buying this property that was then subdivided. The, the Greek Revival farmhouse is still there. Um, it's 1950s, and they became a very huge dairy concern. Uh, in, the, in the latter part of the um, 1850s. So that, that's, this is a big deal. This is, again, 19, if you go into the archives, you can see 1950s aerial photographs. That's the farm. This is what was, at the time, Business 37 here. McDonald's would be right there. Oh. And of course, the bypass, which didn't exist, was right there. And the, IU down here. So you've got low dry stack stone walls all around this area. If you go slightly, go to that luck farm, turn your ears off to all the crazy noises of the student housing, and walk directly east, you come into the Browncliff area, right? Just past Browncliff area, you come to Headley Road. You've got an old school. Headley Road goes to Griffey, right? Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. You're driving along Headley Road, what's there? <laughs> Dry stacks on walls. But they've been repurposed into uh, here. This is holding up part of a, a side. This is along the road right at Maple Crest. Yeah. What is it called? Yeah. Maple? Maple Crest. Maple Crest. Right, right at the T there. And this is in front of a house. This is along the side of the driveway to the IU um, uh, They grow stuff back there. I can't think of the word. Nursery. Thank you. But this is what you see if you're not looking for it. It's there. See it? 
it's all right there. This was substantive at one point. I have no idea who, I have no idea when, but it's pretty close. And if you just go over the hill and Griffey Lake wasn't there, you have a source of stone. It's funny how that works. Um, Bales Road recently had their bridge replaced and bless them, they did not take out the walls. Just past the bridge, we're going to take a look right here. This is what you see. You see the big trees that have come in? So we know that's been there a long time. Here's some more of it. And then the Shabaramis own this property. And this is a wall that cuts south toward Cascades. I have no idea how long that is. It's so long that I can't tell from looking at it from the road how far down it goes. So it, it's, 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 it's hundreds of yards. And I don't know how far down south that that stretch goes. But you can see that this is the same kind of, and I actually have a sample of that over here, it jumped off the wall into my car. <laughs> <laughs> and here you see exactly where some of the, um, the property lines are. The Owenses are here, we're gonna cut across. This is where Bales Road cuts across, right up to what becomes Griffey Creek coming out from here. And this is an area where um, Matlock on property as well. So it's all kind of one big happy area. Okay, Victor Pike. We just went south. Turn around and go south. This photo is by Cheryl Munson. He's sitting in the front. Isn't it pretty? And this is a gorgeous area. Look how long that is. Huge frontage line. I'm going to do it on time. Okay. Better speed it up. Dillman Road and Victor Pike, both awesome places to see these walls. And this is just north of where Ketchum had his farm. This is on the south side of Dillman Road, just past the Clear Creek Bridge. This is on the north side of the road. Both sides of the road have their walls. There's a story here to discover. Here's a repurposed wall, and what else do we have? Repurposed stone on the house. I'm glad to see it reused rather than tossed or buried. Um, and here yeah. is your wall. If you're walking down the Clear Creek Trail, and this is Section 20 in Perry, this wall, you can see it. Here's the bench. You can see the start of it. And this wall is almost six feet tall <coughs> as it walks its way up the hill, which is a pretty steep hill. I have not, not yet been able to get to see that in person, but you can see this from the trail. So this has a story, and it also is a stone's throw from this wall. And this wall is dead in the right away for the Gordon Fullerton pathway that they're, they're starting to build. And we, that's, there it is. I think you've not seen the picture before. And this is what it looks like from the trail. So unless you're looking for it, you're not going to see it. Mm -hmm. This would have been the northern edge of one of the Borland properties. So my guess is there's more in that farmer's field somewhere. And this is what it looks like now. We don't know what will happen. That's looking east from the trail, from uh, the Clerk Trail, to that's um, Fullerton right out there. This is all going to be a connector road within the next year. And where we're standing is just a few, uh, maybe a half a block from the new library, if that helps mm -hmm. position yourself. Mm -hmm. This is just west of the new library. So this area is sort of Clear Creeky. It's just north of Clear Creek. And this line, I'm guessing, right along here, uh, was the north edge of, of one of the properties that they had money. So there's a wall there. I didn't even know it was there, but we found it. <coughs> this one I, I just happened to find on GIS, which is a gorgeous picture. Uh, and it shows you that, uh, I showed you the, the house north of Maple Grove. Look at the lovely walls almost all the way around this house. Here's some more of on Hart Street at the stage where the stage stop, uh, how, this is the house that was a stage stop. And this doesn't have coping sco uh, stones, but clearly this is a, a, a retaining wall, which could, might, be original, we don't know. 
That's my car, by the way. <laughs> this is just a few hundred feet away at the park that's just outside of Ellettsville there, just as you're, you're going into Ellettsville. And it's got walls all the way around it. They're in bad shape, but they're there. All right, so quickly I'm going to go through the cemeteries because I know we're running slow. And if you want more information, you can always get a hold of me and um, get a copy of things. So Bean Blossom, we've got three different locations. Old Dutch Church goes all the way around. Guess what's right there? Creek. That's in the spectrum. You know, it's right there. Uh, Old Dutch Church, and I've been doing some studying in Old Dutch Church and its history. It's really interesting. Um, the, the Pewitt Fife, which is on Creek Bend. I haven't been able to get out there yet. This is an earlier picture of Walker, which has been somewhat restored by the mm -hmm. volunteers here at the History Center. In Bloomington, you've got Armstrong, which is near Maple Grove, Bethel Lane, Dunn, which we've looked at, Maple Grove Church, Mount Gilead, and Rogers, which is on Fee Lane. Uh, Armstrong was recently cleaned up. Uh, this one, I adore this picture <laughs> from the IU archives. There, there they are in the gridirons, and in the back, you see the wall and the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And this one, uh, I found on Find a Great. I thought it was great perspective. I think they probably took it out of the, one, out of the window of the Union. Maple Grove um, is, uh, we know exactly who built it and when from the Maple Grove Church history records. And Rogers Cemetery, this is the one I think that's probably been reworked because uh, it doesn't look original to me. Parts of it do, but you know, this is party central, so it's hard to say. Um, how much of that's original. And then we're going to pop down to Clear Creek, and this is where it's really important to know the difference between a dry stack and something else. You look, you see these conical shapes on the fences and how straight those coping stones are? That's all mortar. We have records showing the CCC did that. The same treatment you'll find out in Lawrence County at the golf course there, mm -hmm. uh, and all the way down to Spring Mill and Avoca, and at that whole Avoca area where the Hamer uh, old mill, uh, old uh, inn is, all of that's the same kind of treatment. The CCC came in. We have those records. Um, I've actually talked to a woman whose father was on that teams that did that. So this is not original, but it may have been from original stone. So that we don't know. Ketchum Cemetery um, is bounded only on three sides. Anybody want to guess why? Backside's a creek. No, no, no. Don't need to worry about that. Nobody's going to get into it. So, but this is uh, one of the earliest cemeteries in the county. And here you see some more of these limestone pillars, which seem to be um, markers. And it is, this is still active and live. If you want to be buried here, you can be. Just ask. Uh, Perry Township, we have one and only, and that's Covenanter. The new, they just put out a book, uh, research uh, about their, their church, but they don't have much about the cemetery. So I want to do some more research on that. But these walls are original and they're in, in pretty good shape, really, for being in such a high traffic area, <laughs> right there at, at High and, and Morris Creek. And that's a very historic area. So um, this is an important cemetery, and it's the only one. Uh, Turner Ridge is inaccessible, pretty much. It's all on private. You can't really get there from here. Uh, and I've not been there yet, but you can see there is a wall. There's a wall there. Who were the skilled craftspeople who built these? I mean, did you just up and start doing it? No. Yeah. What, in, in uh, 1966, when the, the National Historic Preservation Act was passed, it started, it just kick-started all sorts of things. Uh, we begin to see notations of things. We begin to see people being interviewed that were around at the time. Um, obscure papers are written, books. Uh, I love Rachel Peden's books because scattered throughout her stories are little snippets that I've been able to put together to tell a story. And her granddaughter and I talk about that all, all the time. Uh, I think it's just, it's, it's really fun. The folklore students uh, from 1916 to 1990 were everywhere, interviewing everybody. And that history is so rich and full of detail. But a lot of it's been lost. So this is my commercial.
These are lost. These cannot be found by anybody anywhere. I suspect there's a copy in somebody's grandmother's boxes in their attic. So before you throw anything out, please, I'll be happy to go through the boxes. We're looking, I did track down Judith Munns because she is quoted in every National Register uh, application since 1970 in this, in this county when it has something to do with walls or maple grove or even um, stiff bender. And I tracked her down. It took me weeks. But I found her in an obscure location in Alaska. Um, and so we've been communicating and talking and she remembered so much of her interview. She actually interviewed people whose family built the walls and had wonderful stories to share. So I hope to write all of that up at some point. But these are all documents that have been lost. Uh, and if you and there's a, a list if you can find them we'd love you we know that Frank Sater uh, was paid two hundred and seventy five dollars mm -hmm. to build a wall around Maple Grove they've had to break it down a couple times because they needed to put more people in you know, so. and then they started building outside the wall um, the anecdotal information is that old man Ellett I don't know which old man mm -hmm. Ellett that was <laughs> But Old Man Ella was built $100 to build this wall, which is now pretty much caved in. But it's reported to have a 10 to 12 foot base, which I find really hard to believe. Um, but somebody had asked, what about the base? Mm -hmm. This could be, if in fact this is true, uh, this is over the creek, so it needed a substantive base. And then of course we had the stone marked by Jay Adams. Mount Gilead is an interesting one, because not only do we know what and who and when, but we have paper. We have the actual uh, contract deed between the builders and the church to build the wall. And which side was supposed to be prettier, the inside or the outside? Hmm. It's stipulated in the contract that the pretty side is on the inside. So that I just think is just totally cool. I'm still trying to find if we can get records that tell us how much they ended up. Because it doesn't say anything about where did the stone come from because there's really no creek nearby, where, who, and who paid for it? You know, did, their, did the money that they were paid, did that include them having to go get the stone? Holy smokes. I don't know. Do you um, happen to know where the conservancy sources um, to uh, repair the fences? The Dry Stone Conservancy? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a reference on the handout. Okay. They're down in Lexington, and they come here all the time. But how do they source so that it looks like, so they're able to maintain the way? They usually buy locally mm -hmm. their sources, and, and I'm, I'm not sure, and, and they reuse what's there. Because usually they can, re, usually what happens is things get knocked down by a car, mm -hmm. and they can rebuild, or they'll, they'll repurpose and rebuild or shorten. Uh, at the, the Ray Bauer farm up there, um, someone didn't use local stone. So there's a section that doesn't fit and doesn't look right, but you, you do what you got to do. Um, the Owens farm builder, George Wiley, was paid a dollar a day. We have some documentation on that. I'm guessing that Abrams was probably a co-worker. Uh, that was a lot to do. Um, so why does one choose to build a wall? These are some quotes from the very famous Cheryl Munson about the fact that the stone is there, it's easy to get to, it's easy to handle, <coughs> and you don't just build with it unless it's there. I mean, you, you, you're not gonna build fences if you don't have access to it. That's, that's just a summary there. Local preservation. What we want to do, the, 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 I'm on the Historic Preservation Board of Review for the county, and what we want to do is figure out some way, if we can, to preserve what's here. At least document it and find some way to help landowners fix and preserve. That's a big if. A lot going, a lot of moving parts there. Um, but the, the idea of maintaining something, the more you know, the more you realize how important this is to our early history. I mean, agriculture has been forgotten in Monroe County, mm -hmm. unless you go to the fair. You know, it was huge. It's why we're here. University started pretty early, but it didn't grow until much later. 
So the agriculture side is huge to our history. Um, and there are layers of consideration beyond that in, in terms of education and just maintaining what we have and, and sharing what we know. Um, the Rumkey site is a really good example of a way that we were able to get mitigation to save it uh, through uh, county ordinances, which we're going to be looking at and hopefully strengthening. So this is an area where the whole wall was, was uh, going to be maintained because we were able to step in. <clears throat> and there's a long-term maintenance agreement with them. So for the future, what can you do? Um, I'm looking for ways to save that little wall on the Gordon Fullerton um, right away. Go out and find the walls. See the stone. Tell people about them. Look in places. Don't look in Lake Lena. It's all clear. But look, take a look at this map, and you can get this map on the geology page, or you pay for it and get a big paper one. But look around for it. Go exploring. Pro Road. If you're going to, to the back side of uh, North High School, there's a beautiful wall there. But it's, it's a rebuild. So don't get confused on the rebuilds and the repurposing. Um, and they're beautiful, but they're not original. The originals are what tell us where things were. And then Bethel Lane near Bolton House was listed in a couple of references. And then I realized that, oh my gosh, that was in 1970. 1974, they plowed it all down and built a subdivision. We bought our first house there, right on the corner where the wall was. I can tell you, I never saw part of the wall. Not in our yard. Um, find a document, get information to us. Um, you know, we're going to use that information to try to build a preservation process. Um, and just let people know that it's out there. <laughs> Limestone, not just for skin. Uh, you've got a reference on the page to the limestone uh, resources from the County Historic Preservation Board of Review. And I want to leave you with just a little quote from Robert Frost that says, Pencils are good. And thank you. Thank Questions? You.